as we come to Palm Sunday, we deal a lot with expectations. So, have you ever found yourself in an unexpected situation? I'm assuming you had. And as I was thinking about it, it might be a bit of a light example, but this is a real fear of mine, and it's happened. In fact, I've had nightmares about it, and that's this fear. And you might resonate with that, ending up in the wrong class. Anyone do that before, have a fear of that, that you go to school and you sit down in your class and you're getting all ready for English, and the teacher comes up and starts writing math problems on the board, and you sit there, and you know, wait, this is not what I expected. But you know you can't do anything, because if you say anything, you're going to look like a complete idiot or a total fool. And so you sit there for a while trying to figure out what to do, before finally you know you have to do something, and you mention, oh, I'm in the wrong class, and you, you have to get out of there. You're, you're in the wrong one. And in that moment, in that time, you're just hoping that you would wake up, that you're, you're hoping that your expectations would match reality, and you'd break free of this, and everything would be fine. That's, you know, having the wrong expectations there. Now, if you, if you read Scripture, if you read through this, you're going to find plenty of examples of that happening, where people step into situations expecting one thing and getting another, expecting English and finding math, or as we think of the stories like Moses. You know, Moses one day out there tending sheep, his father-in-law's sheep, he's about 80 years old, you know, not a lot of expectations going forward, and he's up on a mountain he's probably been to a dozen times, and, and yet there, 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 there's a burning bush all of a sudden, and his expectations are shattered. Or one that gets me is like a prophet Ezekiel, you know, who, who, who might be sitting there praying and, and receiving a word from the Lord, and then all of a sudden over the hills come these giant wheels with eyes all around, shattering his mind and his perceptions. Like, okay, that's not really expected. Or one that we've talked about recently, a, a man like Gideon, who is preparing to take armies to go fight the enemies of the Lord, and the expectation is they're going to go out with their swords and win the battle, and God says, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, take a, take, take a, take a torch and, and a pot. Now go have fun. You know, those aren't, expecta- those aren't meeting the expectations. And, and we see that not only do we find that just throughout Scripture, but Jesus was great with this. Jesus did this throughout His entire ministry. It's what we call subverting expectations. He took what was expected, and He turned it on, his head, on its head. He, he did that uh, of what people wanted Him for, to do with His rule, you know, that He would ride in and save the day. Uh, he did that with, with his use of the power. They, they, they saw what he was doing. They, they saw him healing people and casting out demons. Well, why, why can't you call down fire then? You know, why can't, can't even the disciples ask that? Can, can we call down fire? Well, that's not how he was using that. And we especially see it in his, in his preaching. Because as Jesus preached, they had an expectation of what they wanted him to say. They wanted him to say the things that aligned with what they already knew, that would tickle their ears. And Jesus never preached that. He preached the truth. And it stirred people up because it did not meet their expectations. He subverted expectations at every point. See, when God enters into a situation, your your expectations need to change. Now, now I was thinking about that as I think of this story. The question might be like, why? Why why do they? Well, I I think it's the same reason why we need those expectations to be dealt with. It's because living here in this world as we do, our expectations are actually set so often by the world. That is, we take the expectations of the world, the expectations of what life will look like, the expectations of what we should do, the expectations of what we should look like, and we take them into ourselves and make them our expectations. Even the expectations that we call religious, even even so we might call Christian can fall into that. These things that we expect, what we hold on to, and then we get upset about things when they don't turn out according to our expectations. When we do good, and it feels like we're not getting the result that we expected and wanted. Jesus steps into the situation here on Palm Sunday at this triumphal entry, and we see it throughout the course of Holy Week that we'll be looking at over this, this week, where He steps in and He says, wait, stop, do not let your expectations match the world. And don't even let your expectations match what you want. Rather, let your expectations match match me. Let your expectations be Jesus. That's what we're called to as kingdom people. See, when someone answers the call to follow Jesus, you you come to him with all of your expectations of what that may be. But what Jesus teaches is that we need to leave those behind and look to him. That's an image of what we see here at the triumphal entry as we turn to this text today. So if you have your Bibles, they're not open yet, open them with me as we go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, what we just read going through uh, verses 28 through 44, the story of the triumphal ent- uh, the entry. We go through this every year as we prepare ourselves for Holy Week as we step through this. 
So you know the story. You, you probably know the background here. Jesus had been teaching. He had been preaching throughout Judea. He's coming on his way to, to Jerusalem. He's taking a route through. And wherever he goes, he's been encountering opposition from the religious establishments, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious establishment who have their expectations on Jesus and who the Messiah should be and what he should look like. And he's facing that opposition, while at the same time, sinners are flocking to him in droves, bringing their own expectations of one who will heal them, and hey, one who will feed them, one who will take care of those needs. A lot of expectations being brought to him. But now, the time has come for him to get to Jerusalem. And if it's, it's time... It's his time, and Jerusalem must be given this chance as he makes his entry. He's giving them the opportunity to respond to him, even though he knows the outcome. He's giving them that opportunity to see the Messiah, even though he knows that he will be rejected, and in just a handful of days, he will be crucified. But here the Messiah comes, and as we see today, as we look at this today, we're going to see how he steps into this dark time. That question then is posed out there, how will his people respond? Will they respond according to their expectations or according to their king? Because that's the question for us. How do you respond with these expectations? So as we're looking at it today, we're, we're going to look at first finding yourself in those dark times, setting the context for Jesus entering into Jerusalem. Second, we're going to look at what it means to know that our hope is coming as Jesus makes His way and we see His power and authority on display. And then finally, we're going to be asking ourselves, are we really ready? Because we need to make ourselves ready for this King who is coming as we hear His words of mourning over Jerusalem. So that's what we're looking at today with Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry. And we pick it up here with finding yourselves in dark times. All right, This is where Palm Sunday begins. This, this is the context for what is going on for these people, for the Israelites. And we all know what it means to have dark times. We all know what it means to, to, to have times where, where we might want to despair, though I'm always reminded of Aunt Marilla in, you know, Anna Green Gables, you know, I, I despair, that means to give up your hope in God, you know, and like, okay, so, but, but we do despair sometimes. That happens, that happens. We, we know those times where things, it seems like things just are not working out according to our expectations, and that is the story of God's people. That is what has been going on for them. When we look at their history, the story of God's people, it's a long and it's a painful one. I mean, we can just pick up just from Egypt, you know. They were enslaved for hundreds of years in Egypt, and then God called them out, and they made their way through the desert, but they failed. And they ended up traveling 40 years in the wilderness while God sustained them, and yet that entire generation passed away. And even when they got to the promised land, they trusted him at first, but that trust waned, and then you had the centuries of the judges where they were attacked and, and they were taken over, and, and they were oppressed time after time. And then finally, they had the kingdom, and yet what we saw was a string of one evil king after another leading the people into idolatry and destruction. Then they lost their homeland to the invading armies of the Assyrians and, and the Babylonians. They got it back for a time, only to lose it again to the Greeks. And then finally, they cried out for help, and in comes Rome. And as you know, if Rome shows up, they're not leaving. So they are stuck in that oppression. Centuries, millennia of oppression they are dealing with. They found themselves hard-pressed. That's the context of what's going on. And Luke gives us a glimpse into that context of what a hard time looks like for these people. Now, it's just a, just a glimpse in the way he tells this story, but, but we can see what is going on here, and we can imagine he's writing this to people who lived this experience. He's writing this to people who are currently being oppressed by the Romans. They understand the hardships they are in. So it's good to, for us to get a little glimpse of that as well. I have a few passages throughout Luke that sort of bring that out. The first one we find is Zechariah's prophecy. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he had a prophecy that he gave that speaks to the hardship of Israel. If you can read it on screen, uh, that's great. If not, the text is Luke 1, 68 through 71, where we read this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. You get an ideal of uh, the, the context and the temperament there in Israel. In the very first chapter, we, have this, we get the state of Israel here. The fact that they are oppressed. 
that they have been hated for centuries. And, and hey, we can see that to this day. I mean, continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but the horrific attacks of October 7th and the, the, outpour, the, and the outpouring of anti-Semitism that we have seen, it is disgusting to see what has come against God's people. But this is their state and what they've dealt with. So continue to pray for them and for the peace of Jerusalem. But that's what it was like 2,000 years ago, oppression for the people of Israel. I mean, that's just one thing. We jump forward a little further, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, uh, we get another glimpse here with Augustus's decree. Uh, we read this, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quinarius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his home, own town. Now, of course, for us, you know, maybe that doesn't mean too much. You know, we, we, we do censuses, we pay taxes, but for the Jews, for Israel... This was the oppression of the Romans. They were exerting their political influence, forcing people to move and travel in order to be counted, in order to be taxed, reminding them that they did not have political freedom. Rome was able to level this command against them, something that was onerous to Israel. I mean, they, 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 and much, Rome did a lot more than that. And it caused a lot of the anger and upset that we actually see in the Gospels. And a lot of the upset why Jesus wasn't fighting against the Romans in the Gospels. But what we see here is that they are doing political oppression as well. A little bit further, we even get an image of what's going on in the heart of Israel when we hear John the Baptist speaking. John the Baptist speaking in chapter 3, verse 7. As the crowds are coming to him, his response to them is this. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, that's an evangelistic message if I've ever heard it. You know, that's a good one to take out there when you see your friends and you want to share the gospel. You brood of vipers! What do you think? But he's speaking to them, to, to the people, to the, even the religious leaders who are coming out to him, speaking in that way, because that is the heart of where they were. The, 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 the religious fervor, the, the true fervor for God to draw near to him, that had departed the people. And they were being called back into it. But here we see that there was a religious darkness in the heart of Israel. Continuing on, just a couple more here, just a little snippet jumping forward to Luke 5, we see this with the tax collectors, just because Jesus is talking to them. Uh, verse 27 in chapter 5, after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a, the tax booth, and he said, follow me. All right, might not mean much to you, you know, you think of like an IRS agent or something like that, you know, big deal, you might not want to hang out with them, but, but you could invite them to church. But here, for the reader reading this, it reminds them of the situation going on. The tax collectors were people, corrupt officials, and they were traitors because these were Jews who were working for the Romans who were taking money from the Jews and usually a lot more money than really the taxes called for because that's how they got rich. And so we see in here just this, this snippet here and a reminder for those reading this of the hardships, the economic hardships that was being placed upon the people. And one final one. And this one, this one does really sadden me, and we see a lot of examples of this in the Gospels, but jumping to chapter 6, verse 7, we see in the image of the, uh, the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. This isn't the story with the man with a withered hand. And these were supposed to be the religious leaders. You know, in our mind, these would be like the pastors, the missionaries, those type of people. And they were willing to use an injured man as an example to catch Jesus, and they were unwilling to do anything good for a person on the Sabbath. What we see here is that the love had left them. They had no love, no love for the people. There were cold hearts in Israel, and that's heartbreaking. We see these things. The people of Israel, they were beat down. They were rejected. They were oppressed. They were defeated and so much more. But in just these couple glimpses, in just the first few chapters of Luke, we see that they have political problems, a general rejection of the religion, a, a sense of religious darkness, economic hardships, and a lost love for others. And I read that and I say, wow, okay, that's not too far from us either, is it? Not nearly as significant, not nearly as serious, and yet we see some of those trends there. These were hard times. But there was hope. People were hopeful. Messiah was coming. People were looking for the Messiah. They were expecting Him, but they weren't expecting Him as they should because they let the world set their expectations. 
that he would come against these things, that Messiah would save them from these hardships, that he would give them the riches they wanted, and they would allow them to escape the pain the way that they wanted to get out of it. Well, what about you? This is where we turn it around and think about it. What, what, what about you? Because you know hard times like this. You probably have known financial difficulties at times. I'm sure we could raise hands and see how many people can be frustrated by our politics or feel oppressed at some point in some way. I mean, I've felt that in, in some small ways. Or maybe just see the a general carelessness when it comes to following God or, or even just noticing, and you probably have noticed this, how, how love has dried up. I mean, it's like, like we're reading out of uh, Jesus' commands about the last days that their love will grow cold. We see that. If you do see that, you see, you can glimpse that need, and you can ask yourself that question, are my expectations in my life and in these outcomes, are they like those of the world, that it would be fixed in the way that I think it should be fixed? Because hope is not in money, and hope is not in a political party or personal freedom, it's not in bigger churches either, and it's not in trying to whip up the love that is needed. What we need to expect is simply this and what is being provided in the triumphal entry. Jesus, and whatever He does. That should be our expectation. So in those dark times, the question is, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to tight? Like, you know, when you're in the roller coaster, when life is crazy like that, what do you really grab for? What expectations are you really holding on to? Because we need to watch out for those reactions. See, Jerusalem was going to learn that. Jerusalem was going to experience that. That hope is not going to be found in the normal things, because ultimately, Hope, even though they were looking for someone to ride and defeat the Romans, it, it was found at the cross, a tool of torture and death of the Romans. Hope, though, is found only in the person of Jesus. So the question is, is your hope there? You know, and I'll throw out the gospel. You guys know the gospel message, but it's one that we need to remember because this is where we need to find our hope, that, 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 that yeah, we've, we've failed, we, we've sinned, and we have chosen to walk away from God as a people in Adam, meaning we have chosen to enter into separation from Him that will become eternal separation, what we refer to as hell and damnation. That is our direction. And yet God the Father looks on you at lo in love. He looks on you in love, and because of that love, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to earth, who became man, who lived that life that you were meant to live, and then he died the death that you deserved, and then he rose again proclaiming victory, that triumphal victory that he has won the day, and that by believing and trusting in him, you have access to the Father and relationship with the Father and a return to him. That's our good news. That is what Jesus is bringing, something against the expectations of everybody in that city. We need to know that hope. We also need to know that that hope is on the way, because while we have that hope now, there is also the hope that is coming, the hope in the return that we look to for Jesus Christ. And now we get to turn our eyes to this story of the triumphal entry, because it's in the context of all that darkness. It's in the context of all that, 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 that challenge and, and, and all that failure, all that pain, that Jesus steps onto the scene. You know, here's the itinerant preacher you know, from way up there in the northern regions of Galilee, you know, that, that, the guy who's been traveling around, the backcountry prophet, essentially, the way that many of them viewed it. But he was something different. He was something different because there have been many false messiahs. There have been many guys come out and say, hey, I'm the Messiah, join, you know, follow me, we'll get rid of the Romans. But here is one coming with power and with authority. And that's what we see in Jesus. That is what is so different in Jesus. So let's take a look how that is put on display here as we look at this story. Uh, picking up here, verse 28. When he said these things, oh, and these things are his lessons and even challenges to the Pharisees. He was already stirring the pot before he got into Jerusalem. But when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. As they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. What, what a strange story. <laughs> 
Like, I mean, we're, we're used to this because if you've sat in any, you know, church service any amount of time, you've heard the story of the triumphal entry a few times, I'm sure. And we sort of get used to it. We sort of inoculate it to the, uh, the strangeness, the weirdness of what is going on here. But this is very, very strange what Jesus is doing. He's been making his way to, you know, Jerusalem. He's been healing the sick. He's been rebuking the Pharisees, preparing for everything. He, he's made a lot of enemies already. You know, he's convinced a lot of his followers to flee. That's not typical Messiah business there. You know, he scared a whole bunch off by telling them all, hey, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they all went running. But here he is, and then he gets to Jerusalem, and he gives that oh-so-strange example. Go, go, I'm going to use a word, he's, you know, I don't mean that it quite like this, but go steal a colt. You know, now he's not stealing everything belongs to him, you know, the cattle on a thousand hill and all that, but still it's not his donkey. And he said, go, go, go get that donkey. Go, go get that colt. You know, I, I was thinking about that like, uh, hmm, probably not a good thing for us to try. You know, won't, won't, won't get us very far. If we were to give a modern example, it would be like Jesus said to his disciples, go into Rushford, and in Rushford you're going to find a nice BMW coupe, and there's going to be keys in the seat. Now go get those keys and, and start the car and bring it here so that I can ride on in. Okay, and if anyone says, ask you, just tell them, oh, the Lord has need of it. You know, we'll give that a try in Rushford and see how well that goes for you. But that is what they're being told to do. Now, the amazing thing for me is that they actually listen. They actually obey, go out there and do that. Um, he gives the command. Jesus gives the command. They listen. And like it, we read, the disciples, they go do it. And they are asked and they say, well, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Again, Try that somewhere else, and you'll see how well that goes. Go into the store, you know, get your groceries and walk out, and somebody stops you because you didn't pay, and just tell them, no, no, it's okay, the Lord needs it, the Lord needs it. Probably won't go so well. Or again, car, you know, go to the dealership. I remember picking out the van not too long ago. You know, go to the dealership, ask for the keys, okay, and then tell them, thank you, bye, you know, and they'll, they'll probably be a little upset if you stop and tell them, it's okay, the Lord needs it. They're probably not going to respond positively because you don't have the power to do that. You, you don't have the authority to do that. Jesus can do that. Jesus has the power. That's what we see here. And the disciples actually get to learn this lesson, which is amazing in my mind. We know that they're going to fail before too long. They're going to run before too long. But imagine how that impressed upon the disciples who went to do that, who actually went probably thinking, man, did he lose it? Did Jesus go crazy? But actually obeyed. And when they took the colt and they said, oh, the Lord needs it, the owner said, oh, okay, sure. That probably had a big impression upon those people because Jesus has the power. And especially, Jesus has the power to do what he says. Jesus has the power to keep his word. That is a truth for us to hang our hope upon. And those disciples, yeah, they probably were a little more confident in the future, obeying him when they saw that power. Now, it's a simple, simple, strange, but simple story. But there's a reason why we have told this for 2,000 years, to remember that we need to take Jesus at his word. Not at your word, not at the world's world, word, at his word, what he says, what he speaks. Now, that does mean you got to know him. That means you got to draw near to him, you know, certainly learn about his life, draw near to him, and obey what he says. And that brings us to the next one. It's not just that power, it's the authority, and the authority that's actually recognized in this scene. So we continue on here at verse 37. Jesus doing some strange things, but getting results. 37, we read this, as he was drawing near, already on his way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's the response to Jesus. Now, in, in Luke, we do read these are his disciples, but in the other Gospels, we, we see other people seem to get involved in this. They get excited and they come out to, to, to see Jesus riding in like an ancient a king of Israel, an Israelite king of old. And he's making it clear that he has the authority. And the people respond to this authority. Remember, as Jesus was out preaching and teaching, that was a response. We, we've never seen a guy like this who preaches with such authority. If he weren't Jesus, this, this would be a, like, a, like a prideful, egotistical display. But this is Jesus. He has that authority. He is worthy of this. And so cloaks are thrown down. People praise God, and they even call him king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We know the story doesn't end there. We know this doesn't last long in the hearts of these people. We know even some of these people who are calling him king today, they might be some of those who are calling for him to be crucified in just a few days. 
but we can recognize the response right here, that they are responding to his authority, because Jesus is king. He is king. Independent of you and regardless of your opinions, he is king of the universe. Calling us is to let him be that in our lives, because that's his triumphal entry, even his triumphal entry for us, because this was the opportunity for Jerusalem, but we also have that opportunity as well, the opportunity to respond to our king as he approaches. Because is he Messiah? Is, is he Christ? Is he really king? Or, like many have taken him, is he just, you know, like a, another teacher, maybe even a prophet? I was thinking about that, because a lot of people do that. We might do that from time to time, too. That is, if you, if you might let him be your teacher, and if you let Jesus be your teacher, uh, you, you, you'll learn to be a better person in life, certainly. You, you'll probably have a better life. I mean, look around our society, I know things can feel crazy, but really we have a lot of peace and stability that, that hasn't been there throughout much of history, and that's because of Jesus. That the teachings of Jesus, even those that, that, that aren't being held on to very well now, they provide us that stability and that peace. His teachings are good, but if we act like He's just our teacher, when we act like that, well, then those teachings are negotiable. You know, it's almost like we have our own Sermon on the Mount. That is, you know, Jesus in a Sermon on the Mount. He's like, you, you, you've heard it said, you know, don't, don't, uh, you know don't, don't commit murder, but I say, even if you're angry with your brother, you know, and so on and so forth, sometimes we can take the teachings of Jesus if we just see him as our teacher. And, and I've heard things like this before, where we say, oh, you know, well, I've heard it said, Jesus, you, I've heard you say, Jesus, don't judge, but you know, I, I really want to. Or, or I really am good enough to do that. Or, and I know, Jesus, you said don't do this. That's great, but I don't want to follow that. That's what you can do if he's your teacher. Maybe, you probably know if you had teachers before, there are times you don't listen to them. Uh, maybe he could be your prophet. Remember when they were at Jesus was asking him, who do people say I am? Some of them were saying, oh, you're the prophet. Well, if he's just a prophet, that's great. You can learn things about God. I, I was thinking it's funny. You know, that, that's the case for Islam. They, they think Jesus is a prophet in Islam. Not God, not Son of God, but he, he's a prophet. So, yeah, I mean, they can learn a little bit about spiritual life there. They can read a little bit about his life and, and learn maybe how to draw a little nearer to God. But he's not just a prophet. If we act like he's just a prophet, then we might let him do some work in us, but we never let him work out of us. That is, we never actually step into that life and, and step into that obedience. That we come to him, but we don't live it out. That, that, that we may be religious, but not responsive. He's just your prophet. But if he is your Messiah, if he's your Messiah, if he's your king, then it's different. Because then you obey. Then you submit yourself. Then he leads the course of your life and he sets your expectations for life. And that's what should set you apart. I mean, this is his claim. We can find several of them, but I don't have the text up there, but if you want to jot it down, it's John 18, 36 to 37. This is Jesus as he's before Pilate, before the crucifixion, and he just, he just opens it up to Pilate. You know, Jesus answered him when Pilate's questioning him, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into this world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The truth is, he's king. Listen to him. Let him fight your battles and win them. Let him have that triumphal entry into your life, so that when he sees you, he doesn't have to say like he says to Jerusalem, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that made for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. That is, a, that is a sad story. Don't be that you in that statement. Let Jesus be your expectation. Okay, so he's coming into the city, and there's expectations. But what are you looking for in Jesus? What are you looking for in Jesus? What expectations are you having? Because that will determine how you respond to him. So what are his words then here to remind us to be ready? That's what we find here, this, this very sad account in the next section. Uh, as we think about this, remember, this is speaking all about his first coming. This, this was his first time here. But are you living for your king? And are you living looking to that next coming? Because here again, we have those subversions of expectations because we develop them, the worldly and the religious expectations. But the Bible, the Bible 
tries to build in us the correct expectations. And Jesus gives us here in this text. Picking up here in verse 39, we read this. As the Pharisees come to complain to him, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if the, these were silent, the very stones would cry out. You know, this is his first opposition now as he's got to Jerusalem. He's right there at the gate, and they're already opposing him. The Pharisees, they don't like that. Why don't they like what Jesus is doing? Because he's not aligning to their expectations. This is not what they expected in Messiah. This is not what they expected to happen. And they did, this is not what they expect of a guy that they don't accept. And so they tell him, shut the people up. They shouldn't be praising you as king. But Jesus makes it clear. He makes it clear to them that they have missed the point. So much so that he can't stop them from crying out because the very world would cry out, here is the king if he shuts up these disciples who are praising him because he is king. But they couldn't see that because Jesus did not align with them and their expectations. All right, so... We don't want to throw the Pharisees under the bunch too much because we can be like Pharisees ourselves at times, as, Tom, you were even talking about there. It's easy for us to say, oh, those bad Pharisees, oh, those dastardly Pharisees out there doing this again. But what about you? How often do you align your expectations with Jesus? Or do you make sure, you know, Jesus aligns with you, or at least try and get him to align with you, or make up a Jesus who aligns with you? This is an easy struggle for us because we're called to conform to Christ, but often we'd, we'd like it a little more if Jesus sort of conformed to us, but that's not how it works. You know, it, it's easy for us through, because of history and preference and other things uh, to sort of build a Jesus we want, you know, sort of put a Jesus together that, that meets those expectations for us to build those up. We have to make sure that we don't get this backward. That's not how it works. It's, it's, it's not build a Jesus, you know. It's not, not create one in your image, we are being conformed to His image. That's why we read His life. That's why we study. That's why we spend like Holy Week going over the story and, and sitting it and, and, and allowing it to, to wash over us so that we can see Him for who He is and follow in His footsteps. Because chances are, you are missing it in some places. Because I know I am missing it in some places. We all are missing it in some places, so we need to go back to that. Maybe even have a little empathy or sympathy for those poor Pharisees who are missing it because it's not just them. It's us as well. That's one we see with the Pharisees. And then finally, though, we also have the big miss, because it's not just the Pharisees, it really is everybody. In this text, the, the last part of the text we're looking at today, verse 41, we read this. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day, days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Pay attention. Jesus wept there. This is sorrowful. Jesus is racked with sorrow for what's happening because he, he can see it. He knows exactly what is going to happen, and these are his people. This is his kingdom. These are his children and his people, his subjects, the ones that he loves, the ones that he came to die for, but he knows that they're going to reject him. And it breaks his heart here. It breaks Jesus' heart to see this. This really hits me hard when I think about this. And that line there, because you did not know the time of your visitation, because his purpose was to come so that they might have peace. He is coming that you might have peace. But for them, instead of looking to him, they looked to the world. And they called it religion, but it was the world and the world's expectations. And because of that, they missed it. They kept the world's expectations, and they faced the world's destruction because of that. So that's a question for us to close on and think on. If he really is the one who rides in triumphantly, if he really is the one who is king, the one who's won the victory, then what are you doing in your life? What do you expect coming before him? See, he did this, entering into this city, walking through this path. He did this to give you peace. Now, have you picked that up in your life? Have you, have you picked up that peace in your life, even though it may be hard because you're going to have to let go of some things to pick it up? Or do you continue to hold on to the expectations of the world and what it's going to look like? This is what he wanted from Jerusalem, the city of peace. He wanted a people trusting him, a people who simply expected him 
So that when he would show up, they would see him, they would know him. His sheep would hear his voice and they would respond because they expected him. So do you expect Jesus? As I said, that might mean letting go of some control and some expectations. I've had to do quite a bit of that lately myself, and some of the struggles and things that we've walked through. It's funny, you notice I have some weird rings and things on me. I know it's strange. If you want to know, I can explain it. I'll talk a little bit more about it. But, but it's funny because I was thinking about it, th this one right here. I have, I have a little ring here. It's funny because it's a little, little, little tight on my finger. It hurts just a little bit. Um, and uh, I put it on, and for me, it was symbolizing for me as I put it on my need to try and control things. You know, my, my need to try and hold on to a situation to control it. Essentially, uh, that slip up where I just want to tell God what to do. Because in the struggles I've had, I've wanted to control it. My expectations weren't met. I've had to let go of some things. But I'll tell you what, as I worked through it and tried to let go of some of that control and say, okay, God, you take it. All right? I'll expect what you bring, Jesus. I'll open myself up for your triumphal entry. I'll tell you, as I've done that, I have found his peace. And I have found him at work. As I let go of some of those expectations, as I try and align myself to expecting Jesus, and that's it. You know, I've seen him, and I've seen him at work. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Because we fight Jesus for control. We, we fight him to hold on to our expectations because we want to control them. We want to have them. We want to determine the outcomes, you know, in our favor. That was what Jerusalem was doing on Palm Sunday. Even as Jesus was throwing their expectations to the side, subverting them completely, even the greatest subversion of all those expectations, the cross itself. So as we enter Holy Week, as we prepare our hearts for the comfort of Monday, Thursday, the pain of Good Friday, and the joy of the resurrection, let Jesus be your expectation and look to Him. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank You that You truly are the one who is in control that we don't need to, to cling to the things of the world. Truly, we can trust you. God, as we enter into this holy week, as we turn our thoughts and our minds to, to things too, at times too dreadful to consider and too joyful to contain, Lord, may we be working our hearts to expect your Son, to expect Him to be at work, to just expect Him, knowing that we can trust Him whatever He does whatever path is laid before us. And in doing so, God, may we come to know the life of Christ in our lives, to live that out in such a way that we know that abundant life and that we can see it grow in others as they look on and see the wonder of what your Son will do in us. God, I pray we would go from here and let Jesus be our expectation. I lift this up to you, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to ask our worship team, or Tom, to come on up here and lead us in our closing hymn. Um, however, I do want to make an announcement that we are going to have a brief meeting after church. Um, I would say, th this is this, if, 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 you, if you consider this your church home, you know, please stay here. Uh, have, you'll have a moment to, uh, you know, to f fellowship and whatnot, and then we'll clear out and we'll get ready to have a brief meeting here um, after dismissal. Uh, so, Tom, if you would come up and lead us. And uh, I'll see the rest of you then at the meeting, right here in the sanctuary. <laughs>